Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're here in chapter 23, slide nine. We just finished talking about blood vessels in, as an intro and then specifically about arteries. Here, we're briefly going to talk about capillaries. Capillaries are the only vessels where nutrient exchange, waste exchange, and gas exchange can happen. In order for exchange to happen across a cell, you need that cell layer to be very thin. And the thinnest cell layer that you can possibly have for humans is a simple squamous epithelium. Oops, E P I T H, epithelium. <clears throat> and so you can see the simple squamous epithelium here, single cell layer thick very, very small diameter. So that let's say you have oxygen inside the, inside the capillary, you can easily have it diffuse out into the tissues or vice versa, you could have some kind of waste like CO2 make its way into the capillary back. And that's what's represented here in this fun animation from uh, Crash Course. They're the smallest of all vessels. They're about the diameter of, a, of an erythrocyte. And you can see an erythrocyte here. It's about that size. So erythrocytes are squeezing through capillaries at some, in some points because of how small the diameter is. And that's a benefit. You want as little distance between red blood cells, between erythrocytes, which are already thin, and the thin layer of endothelium of the capillaries to reach tissues and again, vice versa, to take anything out from tissues into blood vessels. Because they're so small, because they're so thin, they are very delicate. They don't have any tunica externa, they don't have any tunica uh, media, so no smooth muscle, no dense irregular, no elastic connective tissue. All they have is that single layer of endothelial cells. So when you bruise, for instance, like if you get, if you bump yourself hard and you get a bruise, that bruise that you see, that's blood that had spilled out of your blood vessels because you broke capillaries. Your, hope, your, your system, hopefully you're able to clot. There are some conditions where you're not able to clot, which you learn more about in physio, but um, uh, that clotting and that dark, darkness you see is blood that's accumulated in your interstitial fluids because it's escaped your blood vessels. There are three different types of capillaries. Structurally, they differ. Functionally, there's going to be some kind of exchange happen, but what they can exchange differs because of their structure. So the one that we probably normally think about are continuous capillaries. <clears throat> continuous capillaries are found in most places. So major examples include in your adipose tissue, in your, in your muscle, nervous tissue. What you find here is that, of course, you have your endothelial layer, single layer of simple squamous epithelium. For example, here is one thickness of one cell. And you've got your lumen on the inside, um, basement membrane surrounding that, as you always do with any epithelium. Uh, the way that the cells are linked together, there's, there's this cleft here this border between cells. And this border is not a perfectly tight junction border. There can be leakage of stuff into or out of these junctions. Not a lot is going to leak out. If you can imagine one of those hoses where a garden hose where you have like those tiny, tiny little holes in them. So you can get water to the very end of the hose, but all along the way, you got a little bit leaking out, kind of like that. So you do get leakage and that's completely normal. And we'll talk about what happens to that when we get to the lymphatic system. But um, you get leakage of water, you get leakage of ions, stuff will leak in, in or out depending on the situation. That's what you find in most tissues, including adipose, muscle and nervous tissue. The special kinds of capillaries, the first one here in the middle, the second one I guess that we're talking about, is called fenestrated. 
The word fenestration means window. In Latin, if you know French, fenetra, it means window. So you have larger windows, pores. Fenestrations are pores. These circles here are tiny holes that go all the way through the cell. So rather than just having a single cell, here's a nucleus that's just you know thin and flat, you actually have a single cell that has like little gaps in it. So what I've just drawn here is one cell, but it has gaps so that things can pass in between in those little pores. They're slightly larger than leaky junctions. So not only do you have leaky junctions to let in really, really small things, but you have larger pores, larger fenestrations to let in macromolecules. Why would you need larger passageways for letting in macromolecules? Let me back up. What do I mean by macromolecules? I could mean nutrients like proteins. Um, I could mean nutrients like proteins or, or just larger amounts of things. What can't fit through here are cells. So your red blood cells, erythrocytes, should not be, they cannot, they're too small, or they're too big to fit through these pores. Erythrocytes and any other cells are too big to fit through these pores. So why would you need fenestrated capillaries? You can find them in intestinal villi so that nutrients can be absorbed more effectively. You can find them surrounding or throughout your endocrine glands so that you can release hormones more effectively. And you find them in what they're called glomeruli. Glomerulus means ball. If you, if you can't remember that right now, we'll talk about it in more depth when we get to the urinary system. But in your kidneys, in one part of your kidneys, there's blood vessels that allow for filtration. And so by having fenestrations, you can better filter things out from your blood without getting rid of your blood cells. So intestines, endocrine glands, kidney, those are three good examples of where you can find fenestrated capillaries and you need them for different reasons. The third type are sinusoid capillaries. The word sinus, you've seen that before, means a big open space. We've talked about paranasal sinuses, we've talked about the dural venous sinus, so that's air spaces and blood vessels. Here is another type of blood vessel, but in terms of a capillary. It's large like sinusoid. Sinusoid capillaries, um, you can see in this uh, liver histology on the right side here, here's a vein, so decently big. And then sinusoids are these tiny gaps that lead to the vein. From a blood vessel, there's gonna be an artery that we'll learn about over here. <clears throat> These capillaries, also simple squamous, but look at how much gap there is between cells. Huge missing gaps, incomplete basement membrane. These really large gaps allow cells to pass through. Why would you want cells to pass through from in, into the blood vessel or out of a blood vessel? With red bone marrow, remember what happens in red bone marrow? The main thing that happens is that you produce new blood cells, new erythrocytes, new leukocytes, and platelets. Those things can easily escape from the marrow into the sinusoid capillaries and then make their way throughout your entire circulation. Shown here again at the right is the liver. Why do we need sinusoid capillaries in the liver? Liver is important for many reasons. One thing they do is they take in nutrients or really they take in anything that you've absorbed from your fenestrated capillaries and intestines and they sift through it and try to detoxify lots of things. And on top of that, they also produce proteins that are released into the bloodstream. So they're just really interconnected with what happens to your blood. So by having sinusoid capillaries, you're having high, high exchange uh, between the liver and the blood. Third, you have the spleen that has sinusoid capillaries. The spleen, if you recall, is an immune organ that's important for general immune activity, but also for destroying old or damaged 
erythrocytes. So old erythrocytes can come in to the spleen through these sinusoid capillaries and then immune cells, macrophages can start breaking down those uh, old erythrocytes and recycle them. So three different capillaries, continuous, you find them in most places, including adipose muscle nervous tissue, fenestrated, you find in intestinal villi, endocrine glands and kidney glomeruli to have increased exchange, but not so big that, that cells can go through. Sinusoid, maximal exchange, large enough that cells can go through. Capillaries are a lot like roads in a residential area. They tend to be smaller, tend to be slower. You're supposed to drive slow in residential areas. And they're very interconnected. Lots, lots of time in a grid or just some kind of pattern that increases surface area so that you can get to the different residences that are in that area. Capillary beds, capillaries form capillary beds, inter, interconnected networks of capillaries for maximum diffusion. You can see a capillary bed represented here. You can see it represented all throughout here. Just crazy network of interconnected blood vessels, which means there's more than one way to get to a place. You can go this way here or this way or this way. You can go that way, you can go that way, you can go that way. There's so many different ways to get to the same place. You're maximizing diffusion. <clears throat> there are always going to be a network of capillaries between your major uh, arterial leading to those capillaries and then the vein that exits out of there, it's called a venule. We'll talk about that soon. Um, so capillary beds are always in between ar arterioles and venules. Because of, if we want to, let me restart. If we want to uh, maximize how much blood we get to a given area, not only do we want lots of capillary beds, we want to have as much as many alternative routes as possible. If it's really important that we get to a certain area, say your brain or your coronary circulation to feed your heart, um, it's important to have a detour, like a permanent detour route just in case, or just to maximize flow to that region. The term we give for a detour route is collateral circulation. Collateral circulation and extra means of circulating to a given area. They're present in areas where continuous rich blood flow is required. So that means more than one artery supplies to a given area. And often these arteries will fuse together. So you're effectively bypassing capillaries. There's still gonna be capillaries branching off of those areas, but you have an artery directly connecting to an artery rather than artery capillaries vein. Take a look at this, let me clear this. Take a look at this heart um, picture right here. This is an anterior view of the heart. We can see an artery, it's called the left coronary, go this way on the anterior side of the heart. We can also see in this other artery, which I'm gonna color in orange, the right coronary, start here, wrap around the back side of the heart. So now I'm on the posterior side and then come this way on the posterior side. Two completely different arteries, two completely different locations. The heart is super important. We wanna have continuous blood flow to feed the myocardium of the heart. So these arteries are actually connected. They connect right here at the apex. That connection of arteries, whenever you have two arteries that connect like that, Whenever you have two arteries that connect like that, that's called an anastomosis. It's a funny word. Anastomosis, anastomosis. Stoma means, I believe, to connect in Greek or something. Um, anastomosis is a connection of arteries to form a, a collateral circulation. Um, why is that important? Take a look down here. If we want to reach uh, if we want to reach this back side of the heart, or excuse, yeah, if we want to reach this, no, 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 sorry. If we want to reach this front side of the heart right here, let's say that's our destination. We can just easily go to, from the front on that left coronary artery, no problem. But what if, 
what if you have a blockage of flow? So you can't go this way. That doesn't work anymore. What you can do instead is wrap around the back. It's longer, but it's still you know, going to get to the destination. Come back to the front on the anterior side and get to our destination there. So anastomoses are really useful for, in general, when you're when normal healthy people just to have as much blood flow to a given region, but then in a situation where you might have blocked blood flow, you still get as much blood to that part as possible by a, a detour, by this collateral circulation. All right, that wraps up this section of uh, this chapter 23. Next video, we'll talk about veins and cardiovascular conditions. So I will see you in the next video. Please let me know if you have any questions. We need to clarify something. I'll talk to you later.